Okay, so our first presentation is uh, two guys from Rift.io. Uh, we have Tim Mortzolf. Uh, Tim is the co-founder and CTO. Uh, amongst other things, in a former life while at US Robotics, he defined the point-to-point so. -point tunneling protocol and received uh, the PC Magazine Networking Software Innovation of the Year Award for doing that. And we have Scott Mayel. Scott is the, the VP of Solutions Architecture, 20-year uh, communication veteran, and uh, passionate about networking evolution, right, Scott? That's right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hand over to the two guys. No, I'll just uh, I'll just hit it for. I'll give it to Tim. Okay. I'll just be Vanna White. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully the slides stay up better. <laughs> uh, whichever you want, whichever you. Want. Yeah. 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 Testing. Can you guys hear me over here? Okay. So I'm going to try to stand by the podium if you guys don't mind so I can uh, see what we're talking about while we do this. Okay. Looks great. Thanks, Scott. Um, hello. My name's Tim Mortzoff. I'm the uh, chief technical officer with a uh, new startup company called Rift.io that's been around for about a year and a half. Um, we've been in stealth mode, so a lot of you probably heard, haven't heard a lot about us. Um, this is Scott Miley. He's the uh, VP of Solutions Architecture. He works for me at Rift. Um, what Rift does is we write software that um, makes it easier to build um, network functions for NFE. So we've been, uh, we've been in the networking business for a long time, writing software that's worked on chassis for uh, you know, the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so. But, um, you know, one of the uh, challenges we've had is we've been writing network functions that ran in chassis is, um, you know, every company we work at, we write another platform for every chassis that we do. Um, we, we, move, we move from company to company. We write management code. We write the equivalent of orchestration code. We write fabric code for these chassis. And, um, you know, at my last company at Affirm Networks, we adopted DPDK really early on. And uh, we built the concept of how do we do um, networking for um, um, packet core functions within a chassis that work not just for um, uh, of an environment with network processors, but it also we could run the same software in an environment that ran on VMs using uh, either DPDK or not using DPDK. And one of the challenges we had early on is that we wanted to be able to write the software um, applications once and not have to continually modify them as the kind of how you did talk to the networking hardware, how you dealt with the underlay and how you built overlays up. That was, constant, that was constantly changing with us over time. So um, what we uh, decided to do with uh, Rift was to build a uh, platform that makes it easier to write um, virtual network functions that can deal with this heterogeneous environment. And that's some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is how we decided to attack the problem for abstracting the I.O. Um, with all the different use cases that we can use for um, DPDK as well as the environments that we run in that, uh, that, may, or, that may, have, may or may not have DPDK. So we have hybrid environments where some of the VMs run DPDK, some of the VMs don't run DPDK. We have environments where everything uses DPDK and we have environments where nothing uses DPDK. And the goal is to make it really easy for the uh, network functions to work in all these environments but not to have to sacrifice performance as you run in these different environments. So what we found as we talked to uh, guys that built, and, 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 and just as a preface to this, I know probably a lot of people here aren't really familiar with the uh, network function virtualization terminology, so I'll probably you know, step it down a little bit. And, you know, so I apologize, if anybody bear with me, that um, you know, when, if I explain concepts that you already know, I'm doing it for an audience, because I'd imagine there's a lot of people here that don't know a lot of the acronyms in NFE. So in NFV, the, uh, the acronym for VNF, Virtual Network Function, is the equivalent of a network function that ran in the appliance that now runs in a virtual world. So when we talk about VNFs, these are things like firewalls, these are things like S gateways, P gateways, you even have V routers that run in this environment. Um, and what we find talking to the different um, folks that build VNFs is that they want to be able to run these in different environments, maybe one 
um, person that supplies a VNF doesn't want, want to run their VNF in all these different environments. But as you talk to different VNFs, they run those in different um, environments. And when we talk about this, we run into three categories of VNF providers. We run into folks that want to run their software on bare metal, that their, their usage of DPDK is pretty straightforward. A lot of the folks have been using PCI pass-through for quite a while. They know that the stuff with the DPDK V switch is out there. They, they don't really know how to use it because they've been using bare metal and they kind of run in that MPU mindset of you just take over the hardware, you pretty much can do whatever you want to do. Um, and we find that there's folks that are moving from bare metal to private cloud, where they now want to um, provide their software on somebody else's infrastructure. So um, in the bare metal case, the, uh, the VNF providers tend to provide the hardware with their own software bolted on top of it. But when they move to the private cloud model, you'll find that this is the model where operators or um, service providers are deploying their own infrastructure. But the VNF providers need to be able to bring their VNFs and run it on top of somebody else's infrastructure. And in this case, sometimes they have access to DPDK technology for bearer plane and control plane um, traffic, and sometimes they don't. And then when you go all the way to the public cloud model, then you run into a uh, even less restrict, I, I'm sorry, a more restrictive environment where your ability to um, access the hardware is really limited by what the public cloud provider is willing to let you do in the, um, in the infrastructure that they provide. And what we're gonna talk about today is how we designed our um, fabric software. We build VNFs on top of not just what we call interfaces, but on top of what we call a distributed fabric that runs across lots of VMs. And we're gonna talk about how we've abstracted as a use case our um, fabric software above DPDK, above the networking technology, so that you can plug the uh, virtual network functions into this fabric and then you don't have to re-implement the, uh, the bare plane software for the VNF as you move your software between these different environments. Um, so in, 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 in the NFE world, one of the concepts that um, you know, it's talked about in the Etsy Mano model is this concept of VNF components. A VNF component, if you, if you think about a VNF being the equivalent of software that ran in a chassis in the, uh, in the hardware world, a VNF component is one slice, it can be considered like one slice of that chassis. So if we were to think about stuff that ran on maybe a management blade, stuff that ran on a bearer blade, stuff that ran on a security card, the VNF components provide a uh, breakdown of how you divide your VNF into functions that you can independently deploy these units, but you can bring them all back together and connect them to provide a holistic uh, virtual function. And so for the use case we're gonna talk about today is one that we've built on top of our platform. It's a security function that has three VNF components. One VNF component is one that does high-speed I.O. So we could think about this as where the uh, ingress or egress networking comes into the VNF. Um, and in the, ter in the, in the VNF ter terminology, they have a thing called a connection point, an external connection point, where traffic can enter or leave the VNF. Um, and for this, we typically tend to want to run really high-speed I.O. that has access to um, DPDK either in... Uh, um, you know, some sort of SRIOV or even, even PCI pass-through mode for bare metal so that we can get the most performance out of the hardware because we're bringing these packets in. We tend to load balance them and tear them up and distribute these to a lot of VMs that can then um, deal with the traffic once it's been classified. A second function we'll talk about in the security gateway is one of these VMs that receives the traffic after we've done the load balancing traffic. And in this case, it would be something that tends to be um, something that provides a VPN firewall function that still needs high-speed I.O. It still needs access to DPDK, but it doesn't need to um, live on the same hardware or belong to the same load balancing groups of the external function of the VNF. This is an internal component that after the traffic's been load balanced, it can provide a, um, a a software security function on the packet that still needs a high, a high amount of bare plane traffic. Then the third component we're going to talk about is something that's related to DPDK. It's a function that needs to do cryptography functions. Um, tends to be in hardware if we want to be able to do PKI offload. We can use things like AES and I to do bearer plane, or we can use things like some of the uh, crypto cards that run on network processors or some of the uh, uh, in Intel encryption cards. 
Um, and this is a function that needs access to DPDK, probably not as high speed as the first two components does, but it also needs access to a uh, hardware accelerator. And what we're going to show is how we build a uh, universal framework for I.O. that sits, um, that, that abstracts the I.O. so that we can write a VNF that does all these components across a heterogeneous set of VMs that we're, where we've rolled out and deployed this. Um, now, one of the things we run into with uh, DPDK is it's, it's started out pretty simple and it's gotten really complicated over time. And in the early days, I remember when we were using DPDK, um, we were using PCI pass-through mode, you know, just like bare metal, take over the rings, do what, you know, do what you want with them. And the concept of a V-switch wasn't really around at the time. Um, you know, we were using, back in those days, we were using the uh, Linux bridges to move uh, software around in, in the system. And so what we had was a smattering of environments where we would have um, some of the uh, software for networking I.O. was accessing the uh, direct access to the rings. And we'd have other software that would actually inject packets through something like a VETH kernel into a bridge driver. And this was because KNI really didn't exist at the time. Um, and then over time, we've seen this evolution of where we've had technologies such as Vert I.O. where we could get higher speed I.O. than we could do with traditional sockets. Um, we couldn't definitely, you know, this Vert I.O. was more abstract in the sense that we could run it in a um, wider set of hardware targets, but it wasn't as fast as things like um, the, the, uh, the PCI pass-through that we could run. Um, what we found with PCI pass-through, we, we use it today to run some of our networking functions, is we get the best performance out of it, but it comes at a cost that it's really hard to get it to work well with OpenStack, and it's really hard to make it work with any of the SDN technologies out there. So if you want to use something like Open Daylight, forget it. You know, you, you can try to do it. It hasn't been fun, and so we've been evolving away from PCI pass-through, mainly because, you know, we're trying to take these VNFs, stitch them into something that can seamlessly work with a open daylight controller. And as we look at the, some of the technologies where the vSwitch offload is happening in the uh, hardware, you know, if you do PCI pass-through, then you know, all bets are going to be off if you want to um, do any of the, the functions that require access to the vSwitch or some of the service function chaining initiatives that tie into what you need to orchestrate through um, ODL or another type of SDM primitive. Um, SRIOV has been out there for a while. Um, and the, the main use case we see for this going forward is to be able to use it to um, do hardware offload, where if we have NICs that can actually do hardware offload of the uh, vSwitch function into the NIC, and SRIOV is the access method to be able to send and receive those packets, we don't have to directly talk to the vSwitch for most of the packets. This is a really good technology that um, you know, we've been working with uh, some, some of the folks here at Intel to try to get to work, because this, this, this offers the best of both worlds, where you can actually um, you know, talk to an SDN infrastructure, and you can then, you know, still get really good performance when you uh, have the uh, NIC load balance of traffic. Um, so when we talked about that first VNF component, the one that does the load balancing, we can start to do some of the functions in hardware that we were doing in software before. Um, and then the, the, the models we're going to talk about on the, on the right are the ones related to the vSwitch. We've been running our software in four different modes. One where we use an accelerated vSwitch but, um, but we, with a K&I driver, but we we're using a sockets interface, so we're going through the kernel on the guest OS. So obviously this isn't going to be as fast as some of the other methods, but it is an environment that we need to be able to run our software in. Um, and second one is where we, you know, use DPDK with the vSwitch with the IV shared mem interface, which seems to be, you know, not being used as much because we're moving on now to using uh, DPDK with Vert IO and particularly with vHost users. So one of the examples we're going to talk about at the end of this presentation is some of the performance achievements we've recently gotten using offloaded vSwitch with vHost user. And so what Scott did, I mean, this, this, this slide here shows our best understanding of if we go through all the stacks in the, um, the, the different ways of communicating with uh, DPDK, either with DPDK or without DPDK, to do, to do network attachment in the various environments. Um, we, we even had, and this is pretty complicated on, on some of the uh, specifics, even though we use this stuff, it's you know, really hard to you know, pull open the hood and see what's going on to make sure this is exactly how it works. Uh, we know the vHost user spec isn't perfect, we're how it's tied into Vert.io, but um, you know, we've had the guys uh, review it, and um, this, this really shows the complexity of all the different environments that you may want to run your VNFs in, and this is why we um, have been uh, evangelizing on our platform the concept of writing a uh, 
agnostic interface above all this that deals with both how you set up the networking stacks to make this all work, and then how you move the networking traffic in and out of the, uh, um, the, har the hardware as you go through any one of these different various mechanisms. Um, now, beyond to, to get good performance, there's also other things that we've been experimenting with and we find can drastically affect performance of uh, your virtual network functions. One of them, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware, aware of, is the ability in the virtual world to control your pinning, of how your virtual CPUs are pinned to your physical CPUs. Um, because if you um, want to be able to do new more aware scheduling, which we're going to talk about in the third bullet point, having direct control over where your physical CPU is and where your network functions and your, your drivers run um, is critical if you're trying to get the best performance out of your uh, system. Um, you know, huge pages is a must, as particularly as we noticed as we moved into Ivy Bridge technologies. With the, uh, w you know, prior to Ivy Bridge, we were, uh, you know, we, we had to use large pages, but once, w but when we had the overhead of a VM, when, once, once we brought a VM into, into the picture, and, you know, we were running KVM, we found that to, in, a, in order to get a really good um, uh, non-drop in performance as we moved from a bare metal to a hypervisor environment, it was critical that we had the, uh, the IOTLB stuff enabled with, with huge pages on. Uh, I can't stress how important this is from our uh, environment. We still see a hit there of something like 20 to 30 percent depending on the use case, but without the huge page support and the IOTLB support, it was, it was pretty bad um, when we moved from bare metal to virtual machine. Um, I, I hinted to this earlier, the I.O. aware NUMA scheduling, whereas particularly if you have machines that have more than uh, one CPU in them, where the NICs are coming in through different PCI interfaces to the different sockets, being able to control your, wh which CPU is pinned to which core and which interface is pinned to which socket, so knowing that you run your code in this, in this manner where everything runs in lockstep, that's also critical because we find that as you move packets from one socket to another, so if, say if you have a dual socket machine and I'm running my uh, <coughs> PCI interface from one NIC driver through one socket, but then I have the code servicing it, or even the, as we move these uh, software in our fast path code between different queues, if we bounce these packets between the sockets, the performance starts to drop quite a bit. And so one of the things we do in our, um, is we have a scheduler built into our fast path codes that can lock the um, packet, the, the uh, packet um, processing routines down to the uh, core that we run on, but anything that we subsequently can do on the packet. We also have a scheduler that has a lot of affinity rules about which types of queues that you want to move the packet to. And this gets particularly gnarly when you run into overload use cases where you're saying, well, this one socket can only service so many packets and I'm starting to drop packets. So I, I want to do something with, you know, I want to take these packets and put them into another queue and have another core service it. Um, and so, you, you know, the schedulers should, you know, we, we have like hierarchical rules and sense, well, let's try to move it to a core that's on the same socket. And then, well, if that whole socket becomes overloaded, maybe we'll try to move it across the KPI interface to a socket that, that, and put it in a queue that the other socket can deal with. And that's something that, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's not as easy as it, as it uh, looks, particularly when you get in these cases where you actually are running out of, uh, out of memory and uh, CPU bandwidth on the system. Um, and then one thing we've been experimenting with recently that we've gotten really good results for, particularly if you're concerned about latency, is the ability to use cache monitoring, monitoring technology, and particularly the CAT, the cache allocation technology, to where we can control the last level cache um, and um, you know, if we turn this on with DDIO, we get much, much better latency than we do if um, we uh, um, don't use CAT, particularly when we talk about this situation called noisy neighbor, where we have software running on other cores that are doing things that can actually thrash the memory bus. Um, we find that if we use CAT and we introduce noisy neighbor workloads onto the uh, core, that the amount of jitter and latency um, can definitely can be a lot more deterministic than when we don't run this technology. Um, so if any of you guys uh, ha have, haven't used that uh, and you're concerned about jitter and latency, which a lot of the uh, um, VNF providers are, I, I, you know, I, I, we've gotten really good results for it. Um, and so it gets even more complicated, and then we're going to show you how we've simplified it. So if we talk about the uh, world of uh, 
VNFs, and we're running, in this, in this case, we kind of show a, uh, a private cloud. So if we, here, here in this example, we've shown four racks of machines. We've got a, um, you, you don't have consistent hardware across all these racks, but you want to place your VNF workloads across these. Um, so in this case, we talk about NICs that can be of different speeds. We've got um, different hardware acceleration adapters if we want to run our security workloads. We have access to certain uh, processors that have more advanced capabilities um, in terms of what they can do with, um, say, their TXT TPM technology or maybe AESI instruction sets or even the ability to, um, like when we've seen with the difference performance between Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, particularly run VMs on them. Um, and as well as all the uh, NUMA considerations we have in terms of how the uh, NICs are wired up to the um, sockets, as well as you know, how many sockets are running on the machine, how's the memory all programmed. And so what we've done here is I took one of our web UI screens, and we show how we can take a particular VNF component. Um, the box here on the left when we talk about launch new fleet, this is the type of VNF component that we want to provide. And in this case, we took the really simple VNF component number one, something that wants to do high-speed bearer IP traffic. And then what we have in our, um, when we build these catalogs up, you know, the, the NFE has this concept of catalogs. These are things that describe how you roll out a, um, a virtual network function onto virtual assets. Um, so you have a, a VNF catalog and you have a network service catalog. And what we're showing you here is how we build up the catalog for one of the VNFC components for the uh, bearer traffic. This doesn't come out too well on this presentation here, but I, I, I can give you an example of what some of these things are, are on here. So we talk about, the, the, these are all EPA attributes, and some of the EPA attributes are um, things like whether you're doing SRIOV, things about whether you're using a DPDK-enabled vSwitch, how does the DPDK-enabled vSwitch work, do you have access to DDIO, do you use CA, um, the cache allocation technology? So these are all sliders that we can say, these are preferred um, attributes that we'd like to roll this VNF component on. Then in the uh, bottom right box, we show how many uh, uh, VMs or virtual descriptor units, the equivalent of a, you know, a, 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 in the uh, NFV ter terminology, this thing called a virtual descriptor unit, which we're going to look at in a second. Um, we determine how many of these do we want to roll this um, uh, VNF component on top of, and as we add auto scaling, that becomes something that's driven more by SLA attributes than just a static number of VMs. And in the case, in that case, we uh, pre-allocate a minimum number of VMs to start the uh, VNF component. But then, as we measure various KPIs, some of them, including what we're noticing going on in the bear plane, some of the KPIs being internal metrics that we're pulling out, saying, you know, it looks like we're, uh, you know, you know, miss missing the cache a lot. It looks like there's a lot of stuff that's moving from socket to socket. This is stuff we can feed back into the SLAs and decide, you know, in this case, it's better off to add another VM to enhance either a port group or a lag group and to make the, the interface wider across a larger number of VMs in order to keep the system healthy. Um, so, 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 so um, what we've done here is we've really complexified the problem to this point to describe all the different attributes that you've got to deal with. You know, you're running in these different environments. When you're running in these different environments, you have these different hardware components that you're going to run on. And within your VNF, you have these different VNF components that need different hardware components from this environment. And so what we're going to talk about now is we're now going to simplify it. Um, the, simple, the first simplification we've done is we have, in the, in the VDU's descriptors themselves, we have made it um, in our software, any of these attributes that we, that we talk about for the VNF component, in this case we showed a few examples of them, we make them available to the descriptor so that you can have the orchestrator go deploy your service for you, and you don't have to figure out in your VNF how to do it yourself. Your VNF component registers for this. You can either build this through the web UI, or you can create a manual catalog that builds this VDU descriptor, and you let the orchestrator find the best resources that are available for you when we roll the VDU out on top of the virtual assets that we have to play. And this, this VDU descriptor here, um, for those that are familiar with uh, the Etsy, uh, um, standards for Mano. It, this, this, this VDU descriptor is 
pretty much exactly what comes out of the MANO 1.1.1 spec with some differences that we've provided some enhancements for some of the EPA attributes that we wanted to be able to provide that currently are not part of the, uh, the MANO specification. And so what, what, I've, what I've shown here is if we take a VDU descriptor, it, it's actually fairly complicated how many different components it touches when it places a workload. In the top box, we show any EPA attributes that are associated with the guest VNF. So when you run your, um, your VNF itself, these are attributes that are related to how the guest um, VNF um, has visibility into what types of um, EPA attributes are available that are tunable per guest. Um, we then have a section where we talk about the host EPA attributes, the ones that are stuck down into the hypervisor and the, into the host OS. These are the EPA attributes that the VNF itself may not control at the guest level or, or um, be, be differentiated at the guest level, but it's, it, they're ones that you want to be able to control to say, I want a host that has these things turned on in the uh, host because if I don't do this, I'm probably not gonna get the types of performance characteristics that I'd want. Either that or your software may not work at all if you're depending on one of these things being turned on or off. Um, we then have a set of EPA attributes for the vSwitch itself, even though this is within the host, we've kind of broken that out to show that, and this is one of the reasons we've done this is because of all the vSwitch offloading that we expect to happen in the future, that we expect over time that we're going to be able to move lots of functions from the vSwitch onto the NIC card itself, and so that's one of the reasons we decided to break that uh, vSwitch stuff out and to expand a little more. And then we talk in the bottom part about the interfaces, where you actually can control what types of interfaces you want and how you want the interfaces to be uh, um, programmed from a DPDK level in terms of what types of functions they're trying to do. Um, and, and I think you can see down there, what, you know, we, we even refer to whether those interfaces are doing OBS offload. And then we talk about you, you also want to marry your interface to the um, physical network that's configured or the virtual network that's configured in the infrastructure beneath you. So one of the simplifications we do is by isolating this type of stuff into the catalog, the VNF can make a request of what type of VDU it runs on. And what we recommend doing, one of the enhancements we've made to MANO is to not just have one VDU that you can deploy your resource on, but to have a prioritized set of these to say, hey, I'd really like to get something that runs on an Ivy Bridge with DDIO enabled with, um, you know, the uh, a 10 gig NIC that's pinned to the uh, socket that I'm running my code on. But if I don't have this, then I'm willing to dumb down into a mode maybe where I can get vert.io. And if I don't have this, maybe I'll just take sockets because I want the, want the software to work instead of to just fail. And so that's one of the extensions we made in our platform is the ability to have nested sets of descriptors that the VNFs can write with varying degrees of performance they're going to get as they hit the uh, descriptor itself. And then what we do is we have an SLA metric that measures how well you've gotten the re resources that you requested. It's almost like a gear score in video games for uh, your hardware requests your VNF itself. Um, and so the second thing we've done to simplify, we talked about how we do the workload placement. The second thing we've done is if we took this <clears throat> example function that we've rolled out with these four different VNF components, one, this, this, this example isn't one that we would necessarily want, run, but it's one to show you the um, uh, a heterogeneous environment that you could run into if you were getting VNF components from different uh, um, technology providers. And in this case, we show one with a gateway function getting, wanting to use DPDK with SRIOV, a second one with a GI LAN service orchestration soft component that wants to use vhost user through the vSwitch, a third one that for some reason it's still using IV shared mem instead of vhost user. Um, because we, you know, we, we found that it's, it's a lot easier to use vhost user, although I w we'll make a caveat, we'll talk a little bit about performance that we, we're waiting for the multi-queue enhancements in order to, right now we're running vhost user on a single queue, which is you know, really limiting our performance compared to other DPDK methods where we can actually access multiple queues. And a fourth one here, where we're using a uh, KNI interface to re send and receive packets through the VNF component. And so what we did, what we've done in our platform was we've provided in this top box in blue here, and the bottom box in blue here, we're gonna talk about both of these. We've got an IO abstraction layer that the platform deals with in terms of how you get DPDK set up, how you register with the vSwitch, how you program the uh, host, how you program the guest, so that when your network function starts, you don't have to worry about setting all these functions up. And then we've got this software that we call Packet IO Toolkit that provides a neutral API 
that allows you to communicate with the uh, underlying hardware rings if they're present. Um, and if not, it will abstract it over to whatever IO um, primitive that you're, you're using. And if you write your network function to this API, then it runs in a smattering of different environments. Now, um, when we run our VNFs, we tend to use um, two different ones of these at a time. We, we haven't really gone to a use case of four, but I don't see why that, that wouldn't work. And what we find is that one of the use cases we do is one where we have load balancers that use PCI pass-through for load balancing. We have a lot of, you know, multiple 10 gig interfaces. Say we have 12 by 10 gig interface ports and we want to do PCI pass-through and pull in 120 gigs of traffic, look at it, load balance it, tear it up and push it to a lot of different VMs. And on the other VMs, we run something like SRIOV or we run vhost user with a vSwitch where we run a, uh, a networking function workload that's something that, that runs, uh, that's, you know, it's typically running user space even in a network processor world. It's been one of those workloads that's tended, network processors either tended to load balance, get to another card, um, a, a, a packet accelerator card, or it's been one of those workloads that, as you've seen, the network processor support, uh, support for containers and KVM, and you can run these things in user space. It's one of those types of workloads. It's a pretty heavy-duty workload, but you still want access to DPDK, so you can do a lot better than what you can do with typical sockets performance. And we find that a lot of VNF preventers, um, providers still use VertIO for that system. Um, and so when we talk about our packet IO toolkit, these, these are some of the features that we talk about. It's based on a DPDK environmental abstraction layer. Um, it provides a layer two packet API to, you know, to send and receive packets. Um, and uh, these are the different modes that it can operate in if you want to attach your, um, your VNF to the packet IO toolkit that's running underneath it. And we also have some testing and other capabilities. For example, if you want to run loopback devices, if you want to punch your stuff into VETH interfaces with DPDK isn't available, but still be able to simulate ring mode, we have things like this so you can actually test your network function before you're running on a machine that's been set up with the uh, exact DPDK settings that you're looking for. Um, and in this, in this page here, we're showing you the interfaces that we provide in our packet IO toolkit. It's roughly broken down into four different categories. One of these is how we manage the devices themselves. Another is the IO interface in terms of how we can burst and transmit and receive packets. So even if we're running something like a sockets interface underneath this because you're in a non-DPDK environment or maybe you can't even use vert IO and raw sockets is really your only mechanism available to send and receive traffic, we still provide the burst transmit and receive interface. So if you've written your application to use that for a high speed IO function, we will do the same thing in a sockets world. You just won't know underneath the covers what's going on in the packet IO toolkit. Um, we have another um, set of interfaces to deal with how we query statistics out of the various um, interfaces that come out of the uh, system. Statistics for interfaces and statistics for packets. And then we have a fourth category of functions that deal with how we um, set up the uh, queuing and ring policy for the uh, um, for the application. And again, that's something that when we run in an environment that doesn't use DPDK, we really mock the interface out so that your software on top of it doesn't know what's going on. But it still gets just as good as performance as you would if you were using normal sockets because normal sockets, as everybody knows, tends to be, tend to be really slow anyway. So the overhead associated in that world really is pretty trivial. And, uh, you know, so as we go to wrap this up, um, so we talked about, you know, three different ways that we've simplified this. One is to provide a, um, a descriptor environment um, where we can deploy um, VNFs on top of descriptors and hide that function from the application through, through a catalog. The second being the concept of a packet IO toolkit to deal with your bearer plane functions. The third being what we talked about, the IO abstraction layer where we actually set up the host, the guest, and program all the uh, various interfaces that need to be set up for, before your VNF runs. And in this use case, this shows our web UI that what we, what we call in, uh, we call in our web UI, we have this term which we call an environment, which is in the NFE world, it's the equivalent of a network service or a VNF or a network service group. Um, and in this environment, we're showing three different VNFs, one being a traffic generator, 
one being a virtual load balancer that runs in the middle, um, and, and a third being, and I apologize, the picture really didn't come out well on this screen, and the third being a IP traffic sync. And there's a virtual link between each of these VNFs. In the NFV world, the term for how you service chain functions together, they have a concept called a forwarding graph that moves traffic through virtual links. So between each of these VNFs, we have a virtual link that connects these. They just didn't come out well in this picture. And what we showed in this case is how we took the same VNF, we rolled it out in one on the bottom left, we talk about the different attributes that we rolled this out on, the network function itself, and in this case we deployed it on a VertIO system um, that was not using DPDK, and on the right side we had a, um, the same network service running, uh, in a different environment, different set of hardware resources that was using, there's a typo on this page, it was actually vhost user with the uh, uh, DPDK enabled vSwitch. Uh, we've also run this environment with PCI pass-through, we've also run it with SRIOV, but I really wanted to pull out the numbers to show the vhost user stuff because I think that's something that's, uh, you know, it's really up and coming and it's really important. And another thing, so, so when we talk about the performance gain that we got, just running from vertIO um, to DPDK, to a DPDK enabled vSwitch with vHost user, we were getting a 5x performance gain. Now this is the same application that we would get 100 gigabits on if we're using PCI pass-through. And if you look in here, you're saying, well, we're only getting 11 gigabits of traffic. Well, the reason we're getting that right now is because we only have a single queue. When we're running vHost user today, we're able to take a single queue out of the uh, host and expose that for, to the VNF for the uh, application. There, are some, there is some work in progress right now to go to multi-queue support for vhost user. As soon as that's available, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pull the patches in, we'll deploy it, and we expect the performance to be much better because we see, yes? Okay, sorry. Um, because when we run in PCI pass-through mode, if we limit to a single queue, we also see you know, similar cut downs in performance. So um, we do expect that over time the uh, um, vhost user support um, you know, as we get multi-queue support, won't be as good as PCI pass-through, but it'll be good enough for most networking functions where you actually want to run in an SDN environment and actually have the ability to go program a vSwitch. And particularly when we talk about the use case of how we evolve to hardware offload, where the vSwitch functions for load balancing can be moved down into the hardware for either NSH processing, IPsec spies, things like that. We can chop up the traffic that way and then provide an SRIOV interface that um, communicates from the VM NF itself to the, uh, to the NIC driver itself, um, you know, we, we don't think we're going to need PCI pass-through when, uh, when, when that technology is available. And uh, another thing I should point out is in our web UI here, we're showing the difference between the latency. You can see this bar over here on a, um, you know, this, this, this is the equivalent of a, um, uh, you know, so, 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 this, is, this is like a curve. We can't really see it, but you see, you see, you see down here, there, there's a little bit of traffic that's coming in lower latencies, and you see near the end, this is, this is this level latency and everything that's higher, whereas you see, you don't really see a bell curve there. It looks like something that's skewed a little bit, but you can see that the latency is definitely a lot better when we run in the, uh, in the vhost user mode. And uh, what we find is when we turn cat um, on and we can program that for the VNF, that curve really becomes tight. The standard deviation of the outliers becomes much lower and um, the, uh, l the average median latency drops about 20% um, as well from the case where we're not using CAT. So um, to me, the, the drop of 20% in latency is really nice, but the tightening of the curve where we don't get outliers is probably the most important reason that we, uh, we want to use it. And so kind of the... Yep. Okay, so we're getting um, from hop to hop, we were getting on average 20 microseconds median. So we have a VNF where we have a traffic source that sends to another VM that does a load balancer function that comes to a traffic sync that then looks at the traffic returns it to the virtual load balancer, which does a NAT operation on the packet to get it back to the same guy that sent the packet. And at each hop, we're seeing an average of uh, 20 microseconds of latency. So if you're to take the, the, that's actually doing one, two, three, four hops, we're getting for total throughput going through that chain, we're getting under 100 microseconds, and I think the med median was about 80 microseconds that we're seeing with that. Um, 
we, we've experimented a little bit with changing our pull, rate, pull mode driver rates, but as you can expect, the more we, it becomes a, a, an issue of where you wanna pull quickly enough, but not too much, because if you pull too much, then you're, you're doing too much overhead and you're actually slowing your application down for the functions that need to run that aren't just dealing with the pull mode functions, such as the NAT function that I talked about. Um, and so kind of to summarize here, we talked about the three areas that we, we, we worked on to uh, make VNFs work a lot better with the DPDK world. We talked about how we did the catalog descriptors that could allow you to configure these different modes for doing DPDK. We talked about how you can um, um, have a packet IO toolkit that isolates your application from the, uh, the IO interface itself. And we've talked about how the um, control plane is set up by the platform itself so that the VNFs have to deal with it. And what we found by doing this is we've taken a small hit in overhead by providing this network extraction layer, but it's make it, made it a lot easier for us to just onboard VNFs and run them in a large number of environments without changing any of the code, just changing a few descriptors, rolling it out, and uh, watching everything work. So uh, I think that's it. Yes, sir. Uh, in your example on uh, slide 11, I just want to clarify, for, was the traffic generator VNF, the load balancer VNF, and the reflector, are they all running on the same machine? No, these are different VMs. The different VMs, are the same, oh, different hosts. Same host. right. Different hosts as well, yeah. In this example here, we were running one guest per host okay. on this. Rather than going out to the NAS and the switches. Ex exactly. There's three phase switches in between the hosts, and those are three different hosts. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we have done that. We've run two guests per host. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question I heard was if we have an experience running VNFs with more than one guest per host and running them on the same machine. Um, the answer is yes, we have done this. Um, if we, what we found is that if we tear them apart into two separate sockets and treat them as effectively independent, we can still get pretty good performance. But when we tried to run these two guests, we're actually sharing resources across sockets. We've gotten really bad performance. In the single CPU case when we've done it, we haven't gotten really good performance when we've done it. We, have, we are planning on eventually doing what we call compact packing using CAT to be able to better control the cache because that's one of the things we notice is that you'll have one VNF overwhelm the cache of the other VNF itself. And one of our plans next year is to actually be support what we call dense packing where we actually do create multiple guests on the host to run, to share di have different VNF components run onto that um, host, but we're, we're, we're going to do that with CAT turned on to see if that actually fixes the problems we have, because we did find that when we did this, the latency numbers could get pretty bad for us. Um, do you do some uh, workspace latency or you just, you mentioned one microsecond average? Yeah. Um, I don't have those numbers. I know it's under 100 microseconds when we do it. I know when we didn't use CAT, it was terrible. We were seeing every once in a while, we'd get like a millisecond um, when we did that. And we noticed that we could get it under 100 microseconds by doing full isolation of the cores from the, uh, you know, ISO CPU to run the, the uh, kernel separate from the DPDK code, as well as turning CAT on. Those were both imperative when we were running Noisy Neighbor. Keep in mind, when I'm giving you these latency numbers, we were running a Noisy Neighbor on the other cores that weren't servicing the packets. We have, um, and we use the two because we were seeing some difference. I don't know what the exact difference was, but we used the two. So two is better. Was for us, for our, for our test, okay. yeah. yeah. One is, so do I have to that you're closing for the that, that, that's what we do. We recommend doing that if you're using our software. Um, so we've seen in the PCI pass-through case, it's about 10 or 15%. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. In the PCI, it's, it's different in the different cases. So if you're, if you're running it with um, raw sockets, you hardly notice the difference. It's just so infinitesimal. In the PCI pass-through case, which is actually the worst case where we actually do see the overhead of the packet IO toolkit, it was, it was, it was something between 10 and 15% depending on the, um, the packet size you were doing. And the second thing is, uh, is the packet IO toolkit itself? 
Um, so that's another thing I was allowed to say at the meeting. Um, Rifts, can, Rifts made an announcement, they're making an announcement this week about open sourcing our platform. There's a uh, um, community enterprise version of it and we're going to be open sourcing all the Rift platform at the end of this year. The Packet IO toolkit as well as the fast path code that we run on top of it will be available in the community version. Um, I, I, hi, I have a follow-up question to that. So it seems like some aspects of the toolkit are fairly tightly integrated in with DPDK and Open vSwitch. So is this, are, are those, uh, when you say open sourcing the platform, does that include um, contributing back those elements to the um, upstream communities? Yes, we're, our, plan, our plan right now is we integrate DBDK with our software. So when we comp compile the Packet IO toolkit, it comes with the version of DPDK that we have enhanced and put some changes in. But our plan is at some point, it's not gonna be when we open source our code, but sometime next year, probably by, um, I think it's May of next year, we plan on pushing our changes upstream, both the OpenStack, ODL, vSwitch, and DPDK. It's more than just one thing that we have to push them to. It's a, it's a kind of a, whole ecosystem of stuff. Our ability to push those changes into those different environments is obviously, our mileage is gonna vary depending upon the community that we do it to. You mentioned public cloud in your first flight, yep. and then, uh, you know, Barrel. So where do you put your focus as company to open that current system? Yes, right now we've run our software in a hypervisor world. Um, when we talk about a private cloud, um, we've run it on um, KVM and we've run it on VMware, both with DPDK. We have run our software on AWS using sockets mode. We haven't attempted to use any of the SRIO, Vert IO stuff though yet on AWS, but our plan is to work on that next year. Question over here. For um, USB, to my knowledge, KVM does not support when you get USB. Even if you turn it on, then you get VM services. Yeah, I don't think it was one or two. I think it was a smaller number than one that we were doing. We had two different numbers. I could I could pull it out of our descriptor manual and show you what the real numbers are. But yeah, we're, we're, as part of the open source, we're pushing out we're pushing out all the uh, descriptor support we're changing. I think you're right. I think it was less. We had we had different page sizes, and one of them was less than a gig that we were putting into there. <laughs> Level three, yes. The, the cache that's shared between the different cores on the socket. Yeah. I don't think CAT allows you to control level, unless I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But right, the controls we had where we could tune the last level cache that were on the chip, the parameters of how much we wanted to pre-reserve for the various cores before it would get flushed. Is resources of uh, CPU shared or in, in this case? Um, so in this case, the three VNFs, run on different VMs. The, there are multiple processes that run on these. And let, let me clarify this even more. Um, some of the tests that we've run, not this one, um, actually have multiple VMs per VNF, where we've actually have a low balance, we have components within the VNF that are low balancing the traffic, tearing up the traffic, giving it to another VM, and then re-aggregating the traffic as it egresses and pushes it out to an external connection point. In this use case here, we're showing one VM with one, um, one host, one guest per VNF for each of the three. But we have a lot of use cases where we run like three, two, three, five, seven, two. We have other VNFs we run with diameter on top of it, other where we run an EPC workloads on top of it. And we've got a smattering where some of the VNFs have multiple VMs. I think the most we've run is, um, um, it's, it's, it's over 10 and less than 15 that we've run for the diameter test case. We're actually doing millions of transactions per second by load balancing the traffic onto a single IP address and having all these different diameter VMs uh, deal with the traffic. But those, those ones don't need access to DPDK. The load balancer v, VNF component for it does, but the, the, the uh, code we were running for diameter uses sockets and user space, so using DPDK there wouldn't really help us out a lot. But we still use the abstraction layer. In the case where you have a VNF uh, implemented over multiple VMs, is the inter-VM traffic just sort of decent? No. Um, it, de it depends on how we've programmed the fabric interface ports that connect the VNFs together. 
So we have this concept of different interfaces that the VNF gets, one being for the management traffic, one being for the control plane traffic, one being for the bearer plane traffic to external I.O., and one being for the bearer traffic for the fabric. And in those cases, in our descriptors, we can actually determine how we ingress and egress the traffic between those. Obviously, how the bearer plane can do its traffic on the fabric is very tied to how the external interfaces work as well. We don't run in a mixed mode where some of the interfaces are using SRIOV and some of them are using um, uh, something like PCI pass-through or vhost user. So once we've had the VNF pick which type of interface it wants to run the, when it lands the workload on the machine, the fabric uses the same DPDK primitives that the application would use. Can you say that again? Is, is the packet I.O. toolkit just a library that gets in the end links to your? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a library we link into our application. Um, it's, a, it's a dynamic library. You could statically link it to if a .a or a .so, whatever you want. Does it need any uh, further CPU resources extra or runs in the, the ENF context? You know, this translation to this different API instances? Yeah, it has a scheduler built beneath it. That, that the code would need to be aware of, that when it runs, when it runs the pull mode driver, what the timers are, that stuff. So it does have a scheduler dependency that comes bundled into it for good controls how it runs. So could it happen that I need maybe, if I have VNF and if I use the packet I to run, let's say two or one extra CPU just to run the translation? Um, well, it runs in the context of the VNF itself, <clears throat> just like your, um, DPDK code would. So if you looked at like how your pull mode driver ran, when you'd run it, what timer it runs on, whenever it gets the packets and services and the callbacks happen directly from the, the library itself. So I think, you know, if you were using the same type of DPDK constructs for how I was going to run a pull mode driver off of a timer, um, and you know, the scheduler is tied into the DPDK scheduling primitives that are available, I think you'd find the, the scheduling context is very similar. There are a slight number of differences for when we do queuing, and we actually, you know, we do more in our fast path code than just, um, um, so, so, so if you're using just the packet IO toolkit, I'm not worried about it, but we also have a flow engine above it that makes it a lot easier to write your network functions to. And that one's the one that actually has multiple queues and says, let me get the packet, let me look at it, let me do a initial classification. Then I need to service more packets, so I'm gonna move this packet off to a different queue based on the classification operation I want. That's the place where you'd run into more of the scheduling dependencies if you're using the fast path that's set above the packet IO toolkit. But if you just use the packet IO toolkit, we actually have the ability to control how the scheduler can tie into the packet IO toolkit itself. Um, we have plans to add it, but we haven't done that yet. Yeah, that's definitely a feature we, we want. And then the question becomes how much traffic management, particularly for EPC functions, are we going to need to be able to do in hardware? And so, you know, as we do the traffic management, we think that's a beautiful use case for the hardware offload to be able to actually program it, do some of it in software, but try to do it more when it's available in a hardware offloaded NIC. Okay. Yeah, we were running all, all the performance tests when we get good numbers are using um, either the uh, uh, Ivy bridges, we tend to use those a lot, and uh, we're also running this on the uh, Haswell Broadwell processors right now. Um, we, the same software runs on Sandy Bridge and Westmere, it just the numbers start to drive drastically, particularly as we, what we found is if you're using a hypervisor and you don't use an Ivy Bridge or higher processor with the huge pages, your performance hit with a hypervisor for us has been very bad. Yeah. <coughs> Um, how performance is optimal? Well, we have these use cases we can run the different environments in that'll run in the different modes where we'll actually publish the benchmark numbers that we're getting. 
Um, our goal, though, is that other people can download this, run it, and they can measure the performance benchmarks themselves. Um, the, the, the part that we're having a challenge and we're struggling with is how do we accept these patches from the community, push them back into the code, and A, validate that the software works, and B, that we haven't taken a performance hit. Um, the two ways we're dealing with this is one is we have a regression test suite for this that we run various VNFs on top of it and just validate that the VNFs themselves work. And the second is for um, the VNFs, particularly the ones that do the traffic generator, that's a really important use case for us because we can get, you know, with like 500 byte packets, we can get 100 gigabits out of a single machine. And so verifying we don't regress in the, in the use case where we're just sending packets and doing quick load balancing on them, it's something we do internally all the time. So as we take patches from the community, if we notice when we bring those back into the code that the, the patches are knocking down the performance, we're not going to be able to accept them. Can I ask what I mean is how many uh, software developers currently use your uh, packet uh, toolkit? Right, so we're working with two companies right now that, that are using it. We're, we've been in stealth mode for a year and a half, so we, you know, we're, we're just, we just publicly launched our company last week. The first press release came about us, who we are, and we're going out to IDF and telling the world about what we do now, so we expect the number of partners to really go up a lot. Uh -huh. uh, uh, talk about the cash so, so how do you measure them? Isn't the three application specifications what, what function of the NF is doing? How much caching are you doing? Yeah, I think, I think that is, I think a lot of those attributes that you tune in that VDU descriptor I talk about, about what parameters you need for, for DPDK to be set up are specific to the VNF. Um, the one we did with the cache, the, the CAT technology, we ran two types of workloads on it when we tested it. One was we ran a security workload where we were doing encryption, bulk encryption, decryption, PKI, moving traffic through a lot, a lot of VNFs that were doing IPsec encryption. The second was with we just did a traffic um, generator in the bearer plane. The traffic generator takes a much bigger hit on latency jitter when you add noisy neighbor workloads than the security case does because it starts at a much lower latency point and it's moving a lot more I.O. But I, I do think it's very sensitive to what type of VNF you're running. Um, so in your case guide to talk about how you can load balancing, is that part of the packet I.O. toolkit or is that the VNF? Okay, so when we talk about our packet I.O. toolkit, there's there's it's, it's layered and I didn't have a picture of this but it, I probably should have is above our packet IO toolkit, we've built a, a fast path code that we use for our fabric that does classification like layer three, layer four, GTP types of keys, IP set keys. It can extract all these keys and it has a uh, programmatic engine so you can install flows into it that something, you know, for a lot of the flows that a vSwitch can't do, it's stuff that sits above the vSwitch. Um, we, within that code itself, we have our own load balancing technology for how we call it an, an auto scale or a packet auto scaler to say if you have your fast path code and you have 10 VMs that you need to match your traffic to, we insert flows into this fast path engine and it tells us how to load balance those traffic to those internal VNF C components. So that's one aspect of a load balancer we have is how we do internal classification within a VNF component itself. Another type of load balancer we have is in this case, in this picture here, we actually have a VNF itself, which is what we call a virtual load balancer, which is something that sits above the fast path cap itself, where the packets actually come through the packet IO toolkit into our fast path code, get demuxed into a bunch of VMs. Then we have one of these VMs running an application level load balancer called a VLB, virtual load balancer, where we can do things like uh, sophisticated NAT, DPI rules, things like that. And when we talk about the V, we even have. Um, we have this um, VLB is actually, we've got a script plugin, so you can run things like Lua and even Python. If you can write either a C plugin, or if you don't want to you know, spend a month trying to get it to work, you can either write a Lua script or a Python plugin to get that to work on top of it. So the VLB itself is actually its, its own VNF, which has you know, application level load balancing rules that can either be you know, hard-coded patterns that are tied to a C function, where you can put in like NAT classification, uh, carrier grade NAT type functions, or you can run a um, script within it, an arbitrary script, kind of like the uh, iRules stuff that you've seen from another company. Yeah, it's, it's actually a shim between DPDK slash vSwitch slash socket slash any I.O. mechanism that we support and the VNF itself. Yep. Uh, so that's this 
Um, so it's actually the API itself for the packet toolkit in the bearer plane runs in the context of the guest and the context of the VNF itself that you run it in, as well as it runs in the context of other things we do to do load balancing. So when I talked about that auto scaler, maybe your VNF runs over here, but we have an ingress piece of software that runs on a different VM that has to load balance the traffic, it runs over there as well. But then the part where we actually talked about the VDU descriptor, where we actually read the attributes in and go deploy the, v, the uh, VNF on a guest machine with the host set up in a certain way, there's actually pieces that run on the host and guest that deal with kind of the control plane part of it. They aren't in the bearer plane, but it deals with how I you know, request resources in a way that the packet IO toolkit can actually run. And we call that the platform code that presets up the, uh, the hypervisor, the, the host and guest OS itself. Um, one follow-up question. You just mentioned that you integrate with, or you use the API for open vSwitch. What API is that specifically that you use? It depends on the, in the bearer plane or in the control plane? Okay, so in the control plane, we um, either can directly go through OSDB commands, and we've also worked a little bit with ML2 to actually have ML2 go program the open to daylight controller, and then it comes back and programs the vSwitch. That's a work in progress. The second one is we've had a lot more success with OVSDB. And in the bearer plane, it depends on how you're accessing the vSwitch. Are you doing it through IV shared mem? Are you doing it through vhost user? Um, those determine how the packet IO toolkit interfaces with DPDK to get packets into and out of the vSwitch. So the, so that, the latter sounds like um, using the, the uh, API for, for, um, for DPDK and the former sounds like using the higher level APIs on the control plane for OVSDB and maybe OS. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The performance test. Do we have VLANs on the network or do we have an overlay with tunnels? Um, so we supported VXLANs in this use case. We didn't have VLANs per se, but we did have a VXLAN. Okay, I think we're all set. Okay. Well, thanks for the questions, guys. Those were good questions. No, thanks a lot, Tim. That, uh, that was really good. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we were due to break about 10 minutes ago, but there were lots of good questions, so it made sense to let it go on for a while. There's tea and coffee in next door. Uh, if people could be back, we were supposed to be back at 10.15, so if you can stick as close to that as possible for the, so that we can keep to schedule for the next speaker. Thank you.